All righty. Welcome, everybody. Excited to get started here in just a little bit um, with our Glue You of the week. Um, looks like people are kind of filtering in right now. So we'll probably get started in like 30 or 40 seconds. Um, in the meantime, if anybody wants to say hello, uh, where they're where they're from, your name, um, what company you're associated with, their agency, uh, or if you are an e-commerce brand selling online, we'd love to know who we got today. Sometimes we just get names, so um, it's good to kind of know who we're who we got in the audience. If if you are feeling shy, that's okay too. I think I see some friendly faces in there. I think I see Laura in there. MK. <laughs> some of our local friends oh cool like i said let me give people maybe like 10 to 20 more seconds to pull in here um we had almost about 100 people registered so it may take them um all right awesome we're about a minute in so we'll go ahead and get started uh, we do send a recording of this afterwards so um if you you know for anybody who's late uh, they can get caught up that way um, or if you have to jump off early, don't panic. Um, you'll be able to see the rest of it uh, a little bit later. So um, I'm going to go ahead and actually hide my, my camera here and share my screen. Um, and then we will get started. All righty. Cool. cool. All righty. So as I mentioned, today uh, is our Glue University. Our emphasis today is going to be on e-commerce investor insights. Say that five times fast. Um, and the hosts are today is myself. My name is Christian Olofsson. I am the head of client success here at Glue. Um, and then I'm also joined by Michael Ruth, who I will let tell you about all the great things he does for Glue. Hey, everyone. My name is Michael Ruth. I'm the director of finance here at Glue. I'm a certified public accountant, so I have been involved with uh, investor financing for, you know, over five years now and looking forward to kicking off this presentation. Um, you know, if you like what you see here, uh, you know, let us know if you want to see anything in more detail. You know, we would love to do, you know, a, you know, a follow up presentation. Today's e-commerce investor insight presentation will be very much a one hundred and one. So if you want something in more detail, feel free to reach out to Christian or I. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're very lucky to have Michael uh, on the webinar today. Okay, great. So um, I will quickly uh, just mention what we're going to cover today on the webinar. So as I mentioned, this is going to be an emphasis on e-commerce investor insights. So uh, what we'll cover specifically is we're going to talk about the types of investors and investments you typically see uh, in the e-commerce um, business world. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to prepare for those investments. Um, as a business, uh, things you can do uh, and things to be on the lookout for. Uh, we'll also talk about how to run a process. Um, so we'll go through that. Uh, and then the fun part, my favorite part is the glue nerd here, is we're going to talk about what metrics you should be prepared to share with those investors. So we'll actually talk about those metrics, why they're important, what investors are looking for in those metrics. Uh, and then the fun part, how to use glue to actually highlight those and put them in um, decks and things like that. So um, I will turn it over to uh, Michael to go through uh, the All types right. of investors, investments to expect. Great. Thanks, Christian. So like I said, this is going to be, you know, very much a 101 for investments um, in the e-commerce space. Um, and keep in mind when we go into the slide that your mileage may vary. So, you know, not every single investment or investment process is going to look the same. Uh, but with that being said, let's just dive into it and see what kind of investors and what kind of investments are typical in the space. So going, going through the first bullet point, we have seed investments. So a seed investment is, is usually, um, it's basically funding to convert an idea in someone's head into a true business. So, you know, what you're going to see here is typically like smaller investors. So if you look at the table at the bottom of the, uh, of this tab, you're going to see, you know, typically angel investors, venture, uh, capital investors and private equity will make investments into this space. Um, you know, this is really just going to be smaller amounts of money, but um, it's really just 
someone that's willing to take a risk here. And as you can imagine, as you go from a seed investment uh, down to an acquisition, the risk at a seed investment is going to be the highest because, you know, at this stage, you, you may just have a prototype. Uh, you may have more than a prototype. You may have, you know, a few customers. You may just have a small amount of revenue. But for the most part, you're going to see, you know, some angel investors and venture capital investors investing in seed investments so that they can get, you know, that high risk, high return on, you know, the investment into your company. Next, we have, if you could go back, sorry. Uh, next, we have <laughs> expansion investments. So expansion investments, this is where you actually already have a product. You probably have, you know, a good amount of uh, product market fit, meaning, you know, there's probably a good amount of people that are already purchasing your product, um, typically on a reoccurring basis. What an expansion investment is going to let you do is to either A, make key hires so that you can really accelerate your growth, or B, you're going to expand into a completely new vertical that makes sense based off what you do right now. So with these expansion investments, it's definitely less risky than a seed investment, but there still could be things in your product or in your business that haven't fully been, uh, we'll say, that there could be just a few things in your business that's not absolutely perfect. Uh, at this stage where you still, uh, you know, have the opportunity to craft a story into why an expansion investment is going to lead to fixing these issues. So for instance, you may, um, your, your sales might not be growing as fast as you want. So you, so your expansion investment will be, you know, we, we need some additional capital so that we can make some key hirings in sales and marketing so that we can really accelerate the growth um, within that space. So typically ex expansion investments, uh, you know, will come when you're in the, we'll say, I mean, it really could range from anywhere from like $500,000 of revenue all the way up to $50 million of revenue. So it's, it's really a, a wide range. And within expansion investments, there's all different kinds of expansion investments. Um, you know, you're, you're going to see something that's just slightly past the seed stage, or you'll see something that's, you know, more of a quote unquote late stage investment where you're actually just, you know, pretty established of a business. So it, this expansion investment is probably the largest um, bucket that you'll see of these three. Uh, the venture capital and private equity are typically the ones that are uh, doing the most expansion investments. The reason why is this is going to be a little bit, th there's going to be more capital required on these expansion investments. So you usually an angel investor is just, you know, uh, a wealthy individual or like a family office that will make these angel investments. Um, so a venture capital private equity is, is more appropriate for an expansion investment because they're going to put up likely a significant amount of capital. Finally, we have acquisitions. Acquisitions is what, you know, you guys, it, what everyone has heard in the news about, you know, the XYZ startup was acquired by, you know, massive corporate. Um, so that's typically what you're going to see. This, this doesn't require too much um, explanation on, you know, getting acquired. But I would say, you know, a lot of the people that are acquiring them are going to be private equity groups that want to basically grab your, you know, acquire your company or the majority of your company at, you know, one stage and then take it to the next stage and then sell it to, you know, another private equity or corporate group. And then of course, a corporate group is going to acquire um, a brand because likely they want to, you know, just roll it up under their company themselves rather than, you know, pay all this money to develop a similar product to knock you off. They'll actually buy it and it'll typically be cheaper for them to just to buy your company rather than, you know, develop a similar product. So that, that's all on this tab. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about how to prepare. So how to prepare. This is such a key, such a key slide. Um, 
the, the hardest thing is, you know, I, with any kind of, uh, you know, preparation into an investment, you really don't know what, you know, your the other party is going to ask you for. There's, there's so many different things that they could be interested in, you know, going back to the different investors that um, could potentially be, you know, on the other side of this deal they could have all different kinds of reasons for asking specific things. So you want to be prepared going into this process, but you'll never be a hundred percent prepared if that makes sense. So let's go into some of these bullet points and, you know, I'll provide a little context on what I mean by that. So first know how much investment you are seeking. So this obviously, this is obvious, but it's, you know, crucial one of the things that you need to convince investors of is the confidence that you know the direction the business is heading. So one of those key indicators is when you're going up for raising capital, you want to know exactly how much you're seeking and where those funds will be allocated. So for instance, you're raising $10 million, $1 million, whatever that, whatever that capital raise is, you want to know how much you're raising and, you know, generally where those funds will be spent. And um, it's because on the other side, you have an investor that wants to help you. They want to hear your story and help you, but they need to know how they can plug in. So I know this is a obvious one, but you need to know how much investment you're seeking, even if that changes over the development of, you know, conversations. Okay, next bullet point two and three, these are going to go together. So I'm going to kind of talk about them together. Know why you're seeking an investment and know your story. So know your story. That could be, you know, the, the uh, tagline of this whole presentation. You need to have a story on your company, your founders, your team. You need to have a story about the, the whole product. Um, the reason why is, you know, you need a convincing story to uh, convince your investors that not only they're making, they're placing a lot of capital with you, that you'll, you know, turn that capital that they're giving to you into more money, but you need to have a story on how you will do that. Um, and then why you're seeking investment. So just to give an example, say, say you're, you know, running a profitable e-commerce business. You know, one of the questions they may ask is, you know, okay, well, you, I, I have heard your, your margins. I've heard your LTV, you know, you have a great business. Like well, why do you need an investment? You, you know, you just need to be prepared with that reasoning and that reason will change from, you know, company to company and only, you know, the founders or the leadership team will know how and where to allocate, you know, additional capital into your business so that you can take it to the next level. Okay. Fourth bullet point, know your investors. So typically a fundraise process will take anywhere from three months to six months. So, you know, one of the last bullet points is know your runway. So know how much cash you have until you run out of money. Well, you know, when you do need to go uh, raise capital, it's much easier to stay in loose conversations with potential investors, people that would be good fits for investment here. Because it's much easier if they already are familiar with what you do and what stage you're at, so that when the time comes when you do need that investment, you already are warmed up to them and can you know just start that conversation and say, hey, it's time. Let's let's have this. Let's have a more serious conversation than we have in the past. And when you when we go to run the process on the next slide, we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about that in more detail. The final uh, bullet point here is know your numbers. So again, one of the things that uh, you need to do is uh, show confidence that you are, you know, a strong leader or you know have a strong company. And if you show, say you sh you know you send over some do some information that's conflicting, uh, that will be that could be a red flag that you know you have some co conflicting internal information. Um, so knowing your numbers and knowing where your strong points are will be really helpful for telling your story. 
all right, Christian, let's uh, let's go to running a process. Okay, so so by this time, you know, we're going kind of chronologically. You've you know prepped your information. You've uh, reached out to investors. So you have this you know growing list of investors. Um, you you know what kind of information you're going to present to them. Now you're at the stage where okay, now now we're going to get real serious and we're going to actually start reaching out to them in a structured manner so we can actually go and raise some capital. So, and when I say raise capital, this could also be an acquisition. You know, this, this could be all different kinds of, um, all, all different kinds of investments. So what you need to do to land investments. So first and foremost, you're likely going to need to prepare a pitch deck and a pitch deck. There's plenty of templates online. Um, a, a good source may be uh, Y Combinator. They're a great um, source for uh, startups and they can give you the, the general uh, stick of the 10 slides that you'll need in that pitch deck. Um, next, you'll need a data room. It, it's helpful to have a data room if you know you know you're gonna raise if you're real serious about you know an investment, you're, you're gonna say, okay, in the next, I know I have enough money to last me the next six months. However, I don't want to, you know, keep it till last minute. Well, for the next three months, I'm going to open a data room and I'm going to reach out to investors in cohorts. So I'm going to bullet point three. I'm reaching out to investors in cohorts. And the reason why you're going to do that is you're going to say, hey, investor XYZ, I'm, uh, I'm seeking $1 million for X percent of my business. Um, I, I'm looking to raise money by this date, et cetera, et cetera. So now that you have the data room, you invested, you reached out to investors in cohorts, you, you know where the information is flowing. So you, you can kind of control how information is flowing from yourself to investors. So it's important to time box it so that you are always reaching out to people, uh, you know, generally in the same timeline or time frame, so that you can pass that information to them, you know, base, basically pass information to a bunch of people at the same time. So going into point four, this is just a note to prioritize investment and don't chase valuation. So, you know, one of the things that's really important is, you know, a lot of people always hear about, you know, the, the best uh, venture capital firms out there, you know, the, the behemoths of venture capital that I'm sure are, you know, common names to everyone. You know, it, if you have the opportunity to get an investment from them, that's obviously something that would be really helpful for your company. But if someone is willing to give you an investment and you kind of leave them there and leave them off to the side and chase a higher valuation or chase, you know, more status with these investors, they can back out. They always have, they always have the opportunity to back out. So I think uh, a common rule that a lot of people, you know, keep is to prioritize an investment that is, is, you know, potential most likely to happen rather than having to chase a valuation. And then that investment that, you know, was in the back of your pocket, you know, falls out. And then the final piece of information about running a process is don't forget about your business. Um, I think one of the things that's easy to do is you get really excited about, um, you know, running a process, raising capital, you know, all the news that will occur based off this. But then it's easy to forget that, you know, the the day to day operations will almost take, you know, a, a secondary um, secondary approach to you know, this fundraise. So don't let, you know, your met, your important metrics slip because that, that could be the most important, you know, timeline of when your metrics matter most, because you're going to be asked for your last, you know, six months of performance. And, you know, you don't, you don't want anything to slip while, while you're running that fundraise. And one thing that I think is interesting when you're preparing your pitch deck, you need to keep this in mind. Investors typically only review pitch decks for about three minutes and 20 seconds. So keep that in mind when you're designing your deck, because 
you you're, you really don't have much time with them. So you need to make it really compelling, really convincing, but also, you know, at least for a cold introduction, if you don't know them, you know, if, if it's not a warm lead, you'll need to make your, your product and your company really, um, really easy to understand. So just keep that in mind that, you know, th these decks are going to get glanced through really quickly. And if it's convincing, they'll be in touch probably pretty quickly. Um, so that, that's one piece of information. And th the last piece I'll touch on, on running a process, you know, one of the things that happens a lot is, you know, a, a fundraising process can take a, an extraordinary amount of time, both on founders, leadership teams, et cetera. Um, one thing that found, or sorry, one thing that uh, investors will do is more often than not, they're not going to give you a straight up no. They'll say, they'll lead you on quite a bit and they'll say, not at this time, you know, let's stay in touch. We love what you're building. <laughs> they're going to say a lot of these things that maybe you guys have already seen. So keep, keep in mind that investors will say no in different ways and just flat out no's because it's in their best interest to not burn any bridges because, you know, more often than not, one of the companies on this call are just going to have extreme growth. Um, and you don't definitely don't want to burn a bridge as an investor. And then Christian, you can take it away and let's, let's dive into some of these metrics that uh, investors are often looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, just to give you a preview of what we're going to do here, we're going to go through uh, the metrics while they're valuable. And then we'll actually jump into glue and show you where to find them. So um, we're going to start with growth metrics. So one of the most important things, which probably isn't rocket science to any way in the call, is your revenue growth. Um, so investors really want to see consistent growth over time. Um, and typically they're looking to see things like year over year um, and period over period. So, you know, hey, this Black Friday, we sold X amount. Next year, we're expecting, you know, an increase there um, and then year over year, right? And then maybe you wanna look at a five year uh, growth uh, as well. Um, but typically with our newer e-commerce businesses, you're gonna look at that year over year growth. So it's just really seeing consistency um, and consistent revenue changes uh, over time. Michael, you can yeah. feel free to add anything there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I would also add like, you know, going back to one of the bull points I had earlier, knowing your story. So you know, when you, when you're providing that year over year growth or, you know, even your, your, you know, yearly growth on a month to month basis, as in, you know, the, your 2022 performance uh, that's broken up by month. One of the things that, you know, your investor may question you on is, uh, you know, okay, I see a spike in March. Can you explain why there's, you know, such a large spike? And that goes back to knowing your numbers and knowing your story so that you can, you know, provide confidence in the investor to show that you know your business better than anyone you know why customers are spiking in march things like that so i i would i would definitely agree they're obviously looking for you know gr revenue growth over time but also you know can you explain and uh understand you know certain seasonality you know differences in in that year yearly performance yeah, absolutely. So um, the next session we're going to look at is new versus repeat. So a lot of our e-commerce businesses are um, very early in their development. So they've maybe been open for a year or two um, and maybe they're growing fast. They're getting a lot of interest uh, and investors are starting to take a look at you. So one of the things that they're going to typically try to understand is your new um, customer to repeat customer ratio. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's pretty simple, right? It's how many for every new customer, how many repeat customers are you getting? Or for how many repeat customers, how many new customers are you acquiring? Um, why this is important is because um, as a business, you want to understand is your adjustable market, is it ever growing? And then are your customers that you're obtaining, are you able to create long lasting and then um, very fruitful relationships with those customers? So um that's something that's very insightful to understand and typically a ratio that we tell our newer business to aim for um it's going to be something like you know a three to one ratio and what i mean by that is for every three new customers you're getting one repeat 
right? Um, it'll yield out like a 30% uh, repeat purchase rate. Um, that is going to really show, especially in your um, revenue growth, um, a tremendous amount of one, the ability to acquire customers in a consistent basis. Um, but it's also going to show that your product has a repeat purchase value, right? Um, if your business is completely based around acquiring uh, customers and then never buying again, well, typically your acquisition cost is going to be continually high. Whereas if you have a product that once you acquire them, they're naturally going to repeat purchase. Um, that yields a very low secondary purchase cost, which means you're getting more money with spending less capital, um, which is an investor. It's a fantastic thing. So Michael, feel yeah. free to add anything to that. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I liked the metric that you had. Um, typically 20 to 30 percent, uh, you know, repeat your repeat customer rate. I, I think that's typically a, a good benchmark to aim for. Um, it, if you have too high of a repeat customer, you would, you would think that's great. And it, it really is great. Um, but it does show that you could invest some more money into acquiring new customers. So having a high repeat customer rate is definitely a great thing. But, um, you know, it, it also could be part of your story that, you know, just, you know, this would be the pitch to the investor. Just think, you know, if we spent some more money on acquiring new customers, where we'd be things like that. Um, another thing on another thing on this note is, you know, getting that ideal repeat customer rate, having it too low is, is um, you know, it's always depending on the industry and the product that you're selling. But if it's something that makes sense, that should be a repeat purchase, having it too low, is going to signal that, you know, you have a great method of attaining new customers. But there's something missing in terms of, you know, converting the, that customer into a repeat customer, whether it's, you know, on, you know, your, your segmenting and reaching out to them or your actual quality of your product. So um, definitely something you want to keep in, a close eye on uh, with this metric. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last one in the uh, growth metrics is going to be lifetime value. So uh, if you've worked in e-commerce, you've probably heard about LTV. Everybody loves LTV, all the different types of LTV. Um, typically what people are trying to understand and investors are looking to understand from your lifetime value is kind of the profile of your average customer. Um, and as a business, how is that changing um, and improving ideally over time? Um, you know, what an LTV means is it takes a look at all of your buying customers and it kind of averages them out to say, Hey, your average customer spends, you know, hundred dollars, um, at your store. What I want to see as a, as an investor, or what I typically coach my customers to try to aim for is to see that LTV, you know, at the beginning of the year, we wanted the bottom left of the chart. And at the end of the year, we wanted at the top, right? Like we want to see consistent growth over time because new versus repeat actually feeds into that lifetime value. Because if you are, if you are acquiring a ton of new customers, um, that may actually serve as an anchor to your LTV. We typically sometimes see like black Friday, people's LTV kind of goes flat because they acquire so many new customers. Um, so that's another thing about that story, right? Yeah. LTV needs to be improving over time, but if you have a massive acquisition of new customers, that's fine. As long as we know that we have to one, look to that repeat again. Okay. Of those new customers, how many did we actually um, get to be become repeat buyers? And then what was the effect of that LTV? Um, so in Glue, you can actually do a lot of segmentation of different customer cohorts and actually look at different LTVs. Some examples are some customers or some investors want to know, hey, how does your last five years of customer LTV profiles look like? People who bought in 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, right? Um, maybe they want to understand the LTV of people who bought last Black Friday and the Black Friday before. You can pull all that information in Glue. Um, so LTV is very powerful. Um, and having glue as like a partner really enables you to demonstrate that on the fly. So we'll cover that in just a second. Yeah. The, the only thing I want to add on LTV is, you know, one of the thing, one of the things that um, you may get asked is comparing your acquisition, your customer acquisition costs to your lifetime value. So just taking that at a high level, you know, why, why would someone ask about that? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You know, what, what an investor wants to know is at, at the very, very high level, you know, okay, dollars in and dollars out. Okay. What does it cost to buy a customer, quote unquote, buy a customer? 
what is your aka what's your customer acquisition cost okay it costs you ten dollars to acquire a customer okay that's great well what is your lifetime value then also so it costs you ten dollars but the lifetime value is 30 okay that makes sense for every ten dollars I spend to buy a customer, I get thirty dollars back. That's that's a you know to investor standpoint. That that's a cash machine. They're looking for a cash machine. They want to multiply their money. So a, a good uh, customer acquisition cost to a uh, lifetime value is indicate that you know you have a strong business and there's uh, room for them to invest. But that being said, if you have too low of a customer acquisition cost to LTV, you know something under three three times, then they're going to be a little worried. And that's where having a good story and knowing your numbers is really important. And then on the other side, if you have too high of a customer acquisition cost to LTV, meaning your LTV is, you know, 10 times your customer acquisition cost, they, I guess, necessarily won't look down on it, but they would say, potentially, you could likely invest more money into acquiring new customers and bring it down to somewhere in the three to six, uh, three to six ratio. So that, that's all I got on that. Cool. cool. All right. So let's jump into glue, uh, take a quick peek at this. So, um, within the glue system itself to actually find these metrics, the first one we're going to talk about is revenue over time. So, um, what you can see here is under performance, uh, sorry, <laughs> under highlights, you're going to see revenue. Um, and then within this, you're going to see your basic standard revenue range here. You're also going to see today, this week, this month, this year. This section is where you're actually going to see the comparison of your revenue over time. Um, you have some different options here as well. Investors aren't probably going to ask you too much about this, but if, if you are curious, you can see revenue by day of week and time of day. Um, maybe your marketing team's more interested in that for um, when they want to run their ads. But let's just group this by month for the, the simple example here. So this is going to show you period over period. So right now we're looking at so far this year. So it's going to look do a six month look back um, or seven months, I guess it is, of those last seven periods. Now you, what you can do is you can come in here and click previous year, right? Um, and you can see, right, this, this this is a demo store, but they're up 14%. Um, so you can see how quickly you can, you know, you can take this metric and you could say, hey, I want to add this to a report. I need to send this out to my investor group. We're hitting our seven month. Uh, maybe they want to see it every seven months, probably more like six months, but let's say they want to see it every, uh, every seven months. You can come in here. Um, you can email the report directly to them. Uh, you can also click email uh, and you can schedule this to go out reoccurring if you wanted it to go out um, You know, every month. Maybe you want to show up. This is this preset date um, is so far this year. So you can think about this if you send this every month, every time you send it, it's going to have a new month. And it's also going to have that comparison to that same period of last year. Um, so you can kind of put this on autopilot. Um, if your revenue is ever changing and you don't necessarily want it on autopilot, you can do that manually. Hey, Christian. Yeah, I, I just want to add something real quick while you're on that topic. Yeah. So going back to you know the topic of you know, staying warm with investors when so that when the time is right for you to raise investment or, you know, get acquired or whatever it is, it may be worth, you know, scheduling a report to be sent to them if you feel comfortable doing that so that, you know, you can if you're just constantly seeing growth and you're like, I know eventually we're going to need to raise some some money. It may be worth, you know, scheduling a report to a group of investors so that, you know, they, they can kind of see your progress over time. Um, and then also after an investment's made, it can also be used as a tool to actually provide that information to them and, you know, speed up some of the com some of the compliance or administrative uh, tasks that you may have to report to them. Sweet. Um Cool. So the next one we talked about was new versus repeat. So within glue, um, this is actually really easy to find. So you're going to go to lifetime value, new versus repeat customers. Um, another great thing to share with investors, same kind of process here. These three little dots are going to be uh, the key to it. Um, and let's say, you know, in this one, we want to add this to that existing metric that we just did. So you could come in here and you could say add to revenue year over year. Um, and now what you've done is you started to build out like a, a deck of reports. Um, and those that all live in my reports. Um, but again, what we're looking at here is we're grouping it by month. 
And you can see that individual month uh, new versus repeat. So you can see this brand, um, this isn't real data, but if this was real data, that would be pretty incredible. Um, the amount of new versus repeat customers. Uh, and you can see their LTV is being reflected here as having a nice clean jump up in the last couple months. But this is what I mentioned here um, is the next section, which is lifetime value. Uh, so you jump into Glue, you click customers, lifetime value, you'll, you'll see this section here. This is going to show you this consistent growth um, that we're looking for, right? You can see this LTV is going up, up, and up over time. Um, some bonus metrics that we didn't talk about is if you click this drop down, you'll see repeat customer rate, purchase frequency, average time between purchase and relationship length, lifetime value, like to see that go up, repeat customer rate, like to see that go up. Purchase frequency, like to see that go up. Average time between purchases, like to see that go down. And then relationship length go up. Um, so for the most part, we want these things to be uh, increasing over time. Um, but you know, there is one that we we do like to see go down. Um, that is going to be it. And I will jump back into the slide deck. Cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about margin analysis. So everybody likes making revenue, um, but some investors want to know how much money you're making, right? Um, so there is going to be a few different things that we can look at here. Um, one is going to be within product segments. Uh, so there is going to be some profitability, profitability metrics within products and then also gross margin within products. Um, so um, obviously, I'll let Michael talk a little bit more about those and then we'll jump into the Glue platform. But the kind of key idea here is, are we making money or not? Yeah. Yeah. Just the one thing I want to touch on with product segments is, um, you know, one of the things, and, and Christian's going to get into it right now, is like one of the things that product segments can be useful for is, you know, one of the things you'll need to do is bring your investors up to speed on your business. You know, what you sell, how much do you sell, um, you know, all different kinds of things about your products. And being able to segment it in glue can be really helpful for bringing uh, people up to speed very quickly. So um, I'll pass it over to you, Christian, and then we can, you know, kind of touch on it some more. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. cool. So, so as I mentioned, we have products here. Um, you're going to come into glue. You're going to go to your product list. So the first thing we're going to see is our products laid out here. This is going to show them a couple things. One, you're going to see your overall revenue by product. Um, this is obviously an important metric to understand um, how much you actually are selling of a product quantity sold here. But then we're also going to have gross profit and margin. So this is looking at, okay, great. We're selling a ton of this product. Um, maybe this product we sell um, is actually very expensive, expensive for us to make, but it gets people in the door. Uh, and then we have another, we maybe sort by margin and we find a um, very profitable product. Well, maybe we say, okay, how do we take these very expensive products that we're using to acquire customers? And how do we use those to leverage our products that we are make a lot of money in our repeat purchasing? Um, this just goes back to that story you can tell to investors is saying, hey, this is what we looked at the data. This is what we understood. We knew this was our bread and butter product to get people in the door. But ultimately knew that getting them in the door was just half the battle. The next thing was, OK, we got to sell them on different things that we actually make money on. Um, so that's where that, you know, when you're thinking about your bottom line and becoming profitable, think about that sort of thing. Um, another one here is actually customer lifetime value. I'm going to take a little bit from that previous slide. This actually adds a, a, a qualitative metric to your product sales. Um, you can see here that this is saying, OK, great. Our revenue is here and our orders are here. Customer lifetime value actually looks at everybody who's bought, a, bought that specific product and actually gives them a lifetime value. So kind of basically just averages that group of customers. While this is really interesting is to understand, do we have any products um, that have high orders, right? We want to be statistically significant um, and also high customer LTV. And what you may find is you have a product with, you know, hey, in the top 10% of orders, but it actually has the highest LTV or one of the highest LTVs. What that would mean to me is, wow, this is a really powerful product to use in acquisition, right? We know that people who buy it tend to spend a lot more money. Uh, it's also going to be very powerful in repeat purchasing. Maybe this is a product that sparks the interest in repeat purchasing because it typically finds customers that like to repeat purchase. Um, so it's little things like that. Again, and you're telling that story, you're understanding your data, you're understanding, you know, 
what your levers are to pull that can be really powerful in that in that pitch um the next thing we'll look at is like some product segments so uh these are actually predefined for you don't have to go jump into glue and look but you'll see high high gross margin most profitable um some other ones that they like are like top products bundled so understanding products that are typically bought together that's a that's a great aov play aov um is average order value so having a, a cart full of um, products um most refunded as well where are we losing money on products people are we're getting the conversion but then they're refunding it right um abandon are these products that um maybe we need to spend a little bit more money on research or advertising or displaying on our website um and then also we'll look at like acquisition so where are we where are we selling products from most often so is that paid search organic email social um and as you can see here and then also most reordered this is another very powerful segment um as we mentioned investors like lte and they like repeat purchasing um so if you have products that are most reordered this means people are buying the same thing so you may have a subscription play you didn't realize we've seen this a lot in um actually men's clothing um within like t-shirts and things like that a lot of um consumers of those styles of clothing are buying the same shirt over and over and over again. Um, and it's become a massive play. And we've seen those businesses actually like really grow fast that way and just having a consistent subscription. So if you haven't jumped into glue, I would do that today. Jump into product segments, most reordered and see if there's any uh, hidden value in there for you. Anything you'd like to add there, Michael? No, that was a great summary. Nothing to add there. Okay, cool. Um, Sweet. So let's go into marketing metrics. So um, these are going to be ones that they're going to really want to understand. Uh, ROAS and CAC. So ROAS stands for return on ad spend. Um, and CAC is customer acquisition cost. Uh, why these are important is we want to know for every single dollar that we spend, what is our return on that? How much money are we making off of that? We know that in our day and age to get customers, we have to spend money on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok or whatever it may be um, to enlighten our customer base about our products, right? So it costs money to do that. Um, so how much are we getting for that? Um, if your return on ad spend is really, really strong, um, investors are going to love that, right? Same thing with customer acquisition costs. We understand um, how much is it costing us to get a customer, um, you know, and making sure that when we're spending money, that that is the appropriate amount for, you know, the sort of money we have coming in uh, and the leverage we can use with our investors. Anything to add to that, Michael? No, just going back to um, lifetime value um, and CAC, um, you know, th this is back to the comment about, you know, creating basically a company that is a money machine with your customer acquisition costs being in about the three to six times your lifetime value. Um, I think I said, I said that backwards. So basically your lifetime value should be three to six times your customer acquisition costs. So I just want to point out that when we're looking at uh, this marketing metric, it also links to your growth metric, uh, making sure that you're creating, you know, a profitable and uh, scalable and sustainable business. Uh, but nothing to add on return on ad spend. I thought that was a great summary. Okay, perfect. So um, within Glue, you're going to come into customers lifetime value and you're going to scroll down to lifetime profitability, uh, sorry, LTV profitability by channel. You're going to see ROAS and then you're going to see new customer acquisition cost. Um, and some bonus metrics here, profit per customer and LTV over CAC. So this is broken down um, by channel. Um, so we actually channel map this data from GA and we use whatever your e-commerce card is. We blend it together. Um, and then we pull in your ad spend directly from your ad platform. Um, so the powerful thing about this glue is nobody is telling you how much money they're making you. A lot of your um, advertising brands are going to send you a report or they're going to have a portal you can log into that says, hey, I made you $100,000. And then your other one says, hey, we made you a million dollars and da, da, da. And you add all that up and it's seven times as much money as you actually made. Um, and you're like, okay, well, who the heck is actually getting us money? Um, so what we do as Glue is we actually get rid of that. Everybody grading their own homework, if you will. And we actually do it for them. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, this is us taking that. Every single sale only goes to one brand. Or sorry, one channel. Um, and we have two attribution models that you can pick from. Uh, we have first order and last click. So first order uh, is actually something that Glue uh, 
I don't know if we came up with it, but uh, we push it a lot harder than most other companies. Um, and this goes back to that LTV uh, and what investors look for. So first order is essentially, let's say you send me a Facebook ad. I say, hey, this looks great. great. I click I it, go to your website, I convert. Two weeks later, your marketing team sends me an awesome email. I'm like, oh, I got to buy again. I convert again. And then I come direct on my own, right? I'm a consistent customer. If first order, Facebook actually gets credit for all three of those sales. So whatever original channel brought me into your business gets credit for all future sales. Why we think this is valuable is because of how it affects lifetime value. Because of since all future sales are associated with one channel, it has a very clean look at LTV. Um, and what this allows you to understand is, hey, if I acquire a customer, let's say through Facebook, well, Christian, he was acquired through Facebook and all of his peers, they bought three times. Their LTV is higher than somebody who maybe bought through, I don't know, email. Uh, they bought one time, they never came back, right? You sent them a 15% coupon code, they never returned. Um, so, you know, okay, well, it is worth it if we spend a little bit more money in Facebook, because if we acquire people that way, on average, they're going to spend more money than somebody else. Um, so that's what you're typically looking for. Those high LTV channels, let's go spend a little bit more money. And then as we acquire customers through those, they'll probably drop down a tad, right? New customers, lower LTV. Your lower LTV channels, well, you already acquired those customers. So within Glue, you can actually segment out all those customers into a list, send them to your marketing team, say, hey, let's go ahead and, and push these customers to buy again. Uh, maybe send them, maybe send these people, since you already spent money, more coupons, and you're kind of like buying that second purchase through a discount. And that over time will yield a higher LTV. It's kind of like a stock portfolio, right? You're trying to balance that um, and diversify it with your channels. Last click, a little more simple. Um, this is going to be similar to what you, Google Analytics use. Uh, which is um, in that example, Facebook, email, direct, Facebook, first sale, email, second sale, direct, third sale. So whatever the most recent thing I clicked and bought is getting credit for that order. Um, so you'll see there, you can choose between either of them. Um, it's kind of personal preference. If you're looking for more of an LTV, maybe take a look at first order. If you're looking more of on the, um, you know, short term view, last click, maybe more of what you're looking for. Um, and then, as I mentioned, they'll still give you that ROAS metric, lifetime ROAS, um, LTV over CAC, and then profit per new customer. Um, if you ever have questions about these definitions, uh, they're all in here in glue. You just hover it over it and I'll give it to you there. Yeah. The, uh, the, anything you want to add there, Michael? Yeah. The one thing I want to add is, um, on the customer acquisition costs, um, you know, this is somewhat like a, a marketing view of customer acquisition costs. Um, you know, one, one of the things that you may be asked is for like your all in customer acquisition costs. And what I mean by all in customer acquisition costs would be, um, something like blending your, you know, your, your, uh, payroll from sales and marketing into this ad spend to create like an all in customer acquisition cost. So, you know, that'd be something where if you, you know, did your payroll through, or you had your, you know, information through in it, one of our Glue Plus integrations, you could create, you know, your all-in customer acquisition cost um, with Glue Glue Plus, you know, through blending um, that information across a few different integrations. So, if you have any questions on that, you know, feel free to reach out to your uh, CS rep, and they can they can help you on that item. But uh, customer acquisition costs can sometimes, you know, also include you know, basically payroll data. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, like, you know, as much as I love Glue Pro, it is out of the box and it's a very beautiful system um, that takes dev time to change and add things. So that's why we have Glue Plus, um, which is where if you have, uh, you know, a large diverse offering of ad spends and um, customer <laughs> employees and things like that, and you have a lot, a lot of data, um, and to get to that true number, it's going to be a little bit more customized to you. Give me a, shoot me an email, let me know. I'm happy to talk to you about Glue Plus and the value of that. Um, I think that is it for this webinar. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, see if we had any questions. Um, looks like we didn't. So um, I'll go ahead and bring my camera back on here. Um, 
yeah, if you have if you have questions, uh, you think about it later. Feel free to email us. Hope this was um, helpful. I know it's a little bit of a different take on these webinars, um, so we're going to try to incorporate some you know more overall e-commerce topics versus just talking about glue. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, you'll get a follow up email with the slide deck as well as the recording. Um, and appreciate Michael for taking some time out of his busy day to join us today. Yep. Thanks everyone. Uh, let us know how we did. If, if you liked it, if you didn't like it, any feedback, you know, we're looking for. So appreciate everyone joining today. Awesome. All right, y'all. Bye.